Welcome back, guys. We made it. Well, we're almost there. We're on the home stretch. This is lecture 12, the last lecture of CSC 363. Yeah? <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see him. My dog's back. You guys seem to like him when he comes in. Benja, come over here. Let them see you. Let them see you. Up, 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 up. Up, up, up. Good boy. Kisses? All right, you want to do some tricks? You want to do some tricks? Sit. Good boy. Spin. Good boy. Down. Good boy. Up. Speak. Speak. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. And I don't have any treats for him. I'd give you an A+, plus, but I know you don't care about that. You're not shallow like some people. Ooh. All right, bud. I gotta get to work. Okay? <laughs> so what did we look at last time? What have we been looking at for the last half of this course? Well, we've been looking at complexity. How well can computers do something? How efficiently can they do something? <laughs> now he's ripping up his blanket. Bad job. I'm trying to work. I'm trying to make a living so I can feed you in these troubling times. <laughs> okay, what uh, complexity classes did we figure out? You remember? That's right. We had P, we had NP, and last time we saw NP complete. NPC. And, you know, they have certain relationships to each other. For instance, we know P is a subset of NP, but we're not sure if P equals NP or not. And we know that NP complete is certainly a subset of NP. Uh, so let's try to maybe draw a Venn diagram of what we got going on so far. So assuming P is not equal to NP, what do we have? I don't know if you guys can see him, but he's just sitting down there, chewing on his blanket. I'm sorry I didn't have treats for you, but he's frustrated because I made him do all those tricks and he didn't get a, a reward. So assuming P doesn't equal NP, we have this set of problems and we're going to call this set, of course, NP. And P is a subset in there, we know it's not equal. And then we have the hardest problems up here, NP complete. And you know, there's some kind of informal notion of the higher up you are on the, the whiteboard, uh, the harder, you know, the class of difficulty you are to solve. If P does equal NP, then our entire hierarchy collapses and P becomes NP becomes NP complete. Okay, and those I'd say are like the main three uh, classes of complexity. So what, what's the point? Of, what's the point of this lecture? What's uh, the point of the rest of this course? Well, we have two more to get to. We'll spend a little bit more time on, on the first one than the other. But we want to also look at. I'll put commas here. NP hard, something called NP hard, and something called co-NP. NP hard. What is the part of the class, or what is the class of NP hard problems? What is an NP hard problem? Well, informally, uh, so this isn't the formal definition, NP hard is the set of all problems which are at least as hard to solve as the NP complete problems. So it's the set of all problems that are at least as hard to solve as the NP complete problems. Okay, so what's the formal definition? Well, A is an element of NP hard Banjo! It's very rude. What's wrong? No robbers? Okay. You wanna 
That's not bad. It's just interrupting us, man. One of those uh, chatty students in my own living room. Okay, so A is an element of NP hard if and only if there exists a problem I'll call say B. There exists a B that's an element of NP complete such that B reduces to A. So there's many ways to define NP hard. Uh, they all basically boil down to this. If you look uh, online or in different sources, you might see something diff slightly different. But basically, we say, well, if B is an NP-complete problem and I can reduce it to A, then A is NP-hard. And something that you should see or you know, kind of uh, infer from this is as follows. So if you think back, maybe even open up that other tab, and unpause me from the lecture previously, and we're talking about the NP complete problems. What was the, what did we need to show in order to show something was NP complete? Well, we needed to show two things. We needed to show first that it was in NP, and secondly, we needed to show that some NP complete problem reduced to the problem that we were, you know, trying to show was NP complete. So showing something's NP hard, all we have to do is basically half of, or at least uh, one of the points of the things we need to do to show something's NP complete. So in that sense, showing a problem's NP hard is actually easier than showing it's something's NP complete because we just need to show this reduction. We don't need to worry about showing that the problem's also in NP. But this is a problem that uh, students kind of struggle with or an issue they take with this NP hard because they think, well, it's called NP hard. Any problem that's in NP hard should also be in NP. Well, it's not quite the case. And don't get on my case for it, I didn't name it NP hard. But if I were to add NP hard to this Venn diagram here, where this entire circle is the NP problems, NP hard is actually outside of NP for the most part. So up here, this is all NP hard. So it intersects with NP a little bit, because remember we said the set of all problems that are at least as hard as the NP complete problems. Well, the NP complete problems are at least as hard as NP complete problems. Therefore, the NP complete problems are also NP hard. And if uh, P equals NP, we get something like this. So informally, NP hard is all the problems that are at least as hard as the NP complete problems. And formally, you know, it's uh, the set of all problems such that all the NP complete problems reduce to it. You know, if one NP complete problem reduces to it, all NP complete problems reduce to it. In fact, all problems in NP reduce to it. And that's probably the typical definition you'll see. But this is the bottom line. In order to show something is NP hard, we just need to find an NP complete problem and reduce that NP complete problem to that NP hard problem. Okay, well what does an NP hard problem look like? Well you already know a bunch of NP hard problems. Why? Well remember, NP complete is a subset of NP hard. So every NP complete problem of course is NP hard. Okay, well I mean fair enough but you know I want to see a problem that's NP hard that isn't NP complete. Kind of give me an idea of what what this this line is, you know, what that the boundary, what disqualifies something from being NP complete, but it's still NP hard. And I'm gonna give you a couple languages here. So I guess I don't need that quite yet. If you did the tutorial material or if you took 373 uh, with me last term, you should be very familiar with a problem called the knapsack problem. If you don't know what the knapsack problem is, I'm not going to explain it right now or right here, but go take a look at the tutorial material. Uh, it's a very popular problem. You can Google it around. Basically, 
I guess I can give you a brief overview. Uh, you're given n items, each item has a weight and a value, and you have a knapsack, and there's a finite capacity on that knapsack. And you're trying to find a set of items that, you know, gives you a reasonable value, reasonable total value, without exceeding the overall capacity in terms of weight. So that's very, you know, crash course, you know, idea of what the knapsack problem is. Again, go look at the tutorial notes or just Google around. It's a very, very popular problem. I'll call this knapsack one. So it's going to take in a set of items, a knapsack instance. So we're going to have an I, oops, I should say the language, set of items, a max capacity, and I'm going to give it a value K. I'll say there exists a solution. That's not how you spell solution. Now I start thinking, how do you spell solution? There exists a solution which has value at least k. And when I say there exists a solution, I mean there exists a valid solution. I mean there exists a valid subset of items in I such that the total weight doesn't exceed C, but the total value is at least K. Okay, so let's think about this problem. Is this problem in NP? Hmm. Well, in order for it to be in NP, we have to be able to verify it in polynomial time. So if someone gave you a solution, you should be able to check, okay, that yes, that is a valid solution uh, relatively easily. So what would a solution look like here? Well, it's gonna be a subset of items, a subset of items i. Okay, well, to check to see if that solution is valid or not, you just iterate through that set of items, add up all the weights, are the weights less than c, less than or equal to c? Okay, is the total value greater than or equal to k? Yes, then it's a valid solution. Okay, so this is in NP. Okay. Now I'm wondering, Should I give you two more languages to kind of give you an idea, or just one more language to kind of give you an idea? You know what, I'll just give you one more. We can discuss, you know, some potential finer grain languages that might, might lie between, but I'm just gonna give you another version of the knapsack problem. This is called the decision version. Next one I'm gonna give to you, it's also a decision problem, because I'm phrasing it like a language, but uh, it's really gonna encode like the, what we call the optimization version of the knapsack problem. Okay, so I'm going to give it an instance. Oh, and again, if you follow the tutorial material, you've proven that the knapsack problem is NP complete. There's a reduction from subset sum to knapsack problem. Okay, so this one is in NP, and in fact, it's NP complete. Let's look at this one. Okay, it looks similar so far. I'm gonna say the optimal, and when I say optimal here, remember we're trying to maximize our value, so I'm gonna to try to maximize something. So the maximum, the optimal solution, the maximum solution, optimal solution has value k. Okay, think about that language for a little bit. The optimal solution has value k. Is this problem in NP? Well, in order for it to be in NP, I need to be able to verify a solution in polynomial time. So what would a solution look like? Well, it might be a subset of items. And you sum up all the items, 
and maybe it adds value K, and maybe it's a valid solution. But does that mean that, you know, that instance and that value K should be in this language? Well, in order for me to know that, I might say, okay, yes, I can achieve a value of K, but is that value of K optimal? Remember, I'm saying the optimal solution. I'm not saying there exists a solution with value K. I'm saying the optimal solution has value K. It's quite different. And essentially being able to verify that it has the optimal solution is value K, I have to be able to solve the knapsack problem. I need to be able to solve, okay, well, what is the maximum value achievable? And I check, okay, yeah, okay, that equals this, and that is valid solution, fine. But in order for me to figure out what the optimal value is in the knapsack problem, I kind of need to solve the knapsack problem. In fact, there's no really kind of about it. I do have to solve the knapsack problem. Well, solving the knapsack problem is a very, very hard problem. As we saw before, this is an NP complete problem. So this language is not an NP. I can't verify this in polynomial time. I can't just take a solution, double check it across, okay, yeah, the, the subset of items is valid, adds up to K, fine. But I don't know if it's optimal or not. So I can't determine if it's optimal or not in polynomial time without actually like solving the knapsack problem. And I can't, at least I don't know how to solve the knapsack problem in polynomial time. Maybe you do, probably shouldn't sit on that knowledge. But in order to verify this in polynomial time, you essentially have to solve the knapsack problem, which we don't really know how to do. Therefore, assuming P doesn't equal NP, Uh, this is not an element of NP. I cannot verify this in polynomial time. Hmm. Okay. So it's outside of NP, but is it NP hard? Well, it turns out, yes, it is. So the knapsack problem this version of it, the optimization version of it, got, got an email, is NP hard. Hmm. Okay. So that's kind of your first draft of a problem that's not in NP, but is in NP hard. And really that's the difference there. Very similar languages. There exists a solution that has value k or more, or k is an optimal solution. Very different problems, right? In order for, to know if something's optimal over here, I have to solve it. I can't really verify in polynomial time. Over here, I can verify it in polynomial time. Okay. Well, how do I know that this is NP hard besides the fact that I just told you? Well, I'll leave that as an exercise for you but it's actually very similar to this one over here. So if, uh, if you want to know more about that, we can talk about it on Piazza or uh, in a review session or something like that. But you can just trust me for now that this is NP hard. Okay, so for all these NP complete problems, we kind of have the optimization version that, you know, it's not quite NP complete because we can't verify in polynomial time. So you have that coupling there. But is there anything else? Or is it just kind of like versions of the NP complete problems that are also NP hard? Hmm. Well, this is where the course, in some sense, comes full circle. And everything you've learned up to now, you know, comes together and we try to prove something that requires, you know, the entire course to understand. I mean, this course is very structured layer by layer and really to understand this type of stuff, you do have to understand the rest of the course. But, uh, well, what am, I, what am I getting at here? Well, I'll hit you with the theorem. The 
the membership problem is NP hard. Ooh. It's kind of like worlds colliding, right? Because we didn't deal with all this, like, you know, membership stuff, halting problem, all that uh, mapping reduction. That was for the first half of the course. I thought we were done with that stuff. You know, I was kind of actually starting to enjoy these uh, algorithmic reductions, right? I, I, man, why do you have to bring this back? Well, it's not as bad as you think, but it, it does get a little bit subtle again. But not to lose you, don't worry. We'll figure this out. Let's try to prove this. Hmm. Well, in order to prove this is NP hard, I need to show that an NP complete problem reduces uh, to ATN. So I need to show any NP complete problem reduces to ATM. What one should I use? And you start thinking, well, usually when I approach these questions, I'll use, you know, something, a problem that has like similar structure, right? If we're dealing with a graphing problem, like we're trying to show uh, click, for instance, was uh, NP complete, maybe start with vertex cover or uh, what was that other one? Independent set. Uh, you know, when we're dealing with partition, subset sum seem like a good candidate. What do I use here? Hmm. And remember, I guess I can always rewrite ATM just as a reference. It's the language of all Turing machines and strings such that M accepts W. And that doesn't really look like any of the problems we've seen in NP complete. Yeah, you're probably right about that. Well, if it doesn't look like anything we've seen really, let's just start off with the basic NP complete problem, like the foundation of NP complete problems. Let's try to show that 3SAT reduces to ATM. How might we go about that, doing that? Okay, well, I'm going to assume I have a black box which solves the ATM problem. So I can give this black box a Turing machine and an input string, and it can determine, okay, uh, this, give me the answer for free. Yes, this particular Turing machine accepts this string, or no, it does not accept this string. So we assume we have that black box. If we have that black box, can we come up with a polynomial time solution to 3SAT? Well, it's actually not too bad. Because watch this. Here's my idea. Given, and what's uh, an instance of 3SAT look like? Well, it's just a Boolean expression, right? In that three, uh, three conjunctive normal form form, right? But it really is just a Boolean expression. Can we satisfy this thing? So given V, we want to know, is it an element of 3SAT? Hmm. Okay. Well, let's construct a Turing machine. And this Turing machine is going to take in Boolean expressions, the form of 3SAT, and it's going to try to determine if this thing is satisfiable or not. Okay, construct a Turing machine M such that, you know, I guess I can do the rest over here. So this Turing machine is going to take in uh, a Boolean expression, and the idea is it's going to, in some sense, try to solve this 3SAT problem. Well, can you solve the 3SAT problem? Well, I don't know if you can solve it in polynomial time or not, but we can definitely brute force it. Nothing wrong with brute forcing it. It's going to be a finite amount of time. 
uh, before we can solve any instance of a three-step problem brute force. It's exponential, but still finite. So brute force solve B. So all we're doing is brute force solving B. Okay, if B is satisfiable, I'll just write sat for satisfiable. So if B is satisfiable, accept. If B is not satisfiable, Reject. So this is our polynomial, or sorry, yes, our polynomial reduction so far. So we're given this instance of B. We construct this Turing machine. We construct this Turing machine M, and it takes in a Boolean expression in you know the three sat form, and it we design it so a brute force solves B. Okay, now what do we do? Well, I have my ATM black box. I'll call it ATM black box on. And what do I call it on? M and B. I'm asking my ATM black box, does M accept B? is my question that I'm asking the black box. Remember, I'm given this Boolean expression. I want to know, is it an element of three set? Right? I want to know, yes or no, is it an element of three set? Hmm. Well, I'm just going to write this out and we'll talk about it in a little bit. But if yes, yes. If no, no. So let's think about this. When is the only case that M accepts B? Well, the only time that M is going to accept B is if B is satisfiable. So if M accepts B, and remember, this black, ba black box runs in constant time. Well, if M accepts B, what do I do? Well, that means that the B was satisfiable and is therefore an element of 3sat, so I return yes. If M, or sorry, yeah, if M does not accept B, so I said reject here, I could say even loop. Reject or loop, both are going to be fine. But if my ATM black box says no, M does not accept B, that means that B is not satisfiable. So no, it doesn't accept B, therefore no, B is not satisfiable. But maybe there's a few, so... Right now, you should see how this works, and it does work. And it's pretty pretty straightforward, actually. It's a little tricky, like with the mapping reductions from before. Maybe not as concrete as the ones we have been doing, but it's pretty good, pretty straightforward. Okay. And it does work, I will say that, but maybe some of you have, have some problems with this. Hmm. What might be the first problem? Well, remember, we have to do this reduction in polynomial time. And over here, my Turing machine is brute force solving a three sat problem. So you might have something scratching in the back of your mind being like, something doesn't seem right here. We're tr doing this in polynomial time, and we're just like assuming that this is going to run in polynomial time seems wrong. Well, you need to understand and be very clear and have a strong grasp on what the reduction is doing and what it's not doing. What the reduction is doing is constructing this machine. What the reduction is not doing is running this machine. Okay, big difference. For instance, how long would it take you to 
write a program that brute force solves the three sat problem. You know, uh, assuming you know how to do it. <laughs> I, I won't be mean or anything there, but like, let's say uh, I'll give you a week. Could you do it? Yeah, you could do it. Give you a day. Could you do it? Yeah, you could do it. But here's the idea. When you come up with that solution, does it matter if I give you uh, a Boolean expression that has a thousand variables, a billion var variables, you know, 10 billion factorial variables? Is that solution still going to be a valid solution? Well, yeah, assuming, you know, you know, you have a very powerful machine and large amount of memory, given enough time, it still will be able to brute force it. It's not like your solution is going to change based off the input side. What I'm trying to get at here is for you to write the program, is com the time for you to write the program is completely independent from the size of B. Or in other words, the time it takes you to write the program is constant time. Right? Running your program could take very, very, very long. But you writing the program doesn't take long at all. It takes constant time. You know, we talked about this a little bit before when we were doing mapping reductions. There's a difference between, you know, writing a Turing machine that has an infinite loop in it, that loops, and, uh, and running it, right? In finite time, and very quickly, you can write a program that runs infinitely, that has an infinite loop, that loops forever. But uh, writing the program doesn't take a lot of time. Running the program takes a very, very long time. In fact, it, it'll never terminate. Same thing here. We can write this program, we can create this machine in constant time. It's true that yes, if we brute force all this going to run it in exponential time, but we never run it. Why don't we run it? Well, we're just asking the black box. We give the Turing machine an input, and we're just asking, will this machine accept this input? We're not actually running the program. This runs in constant time, remember? That's part of our assumption. It's like an oracle. It's just a yes or no. So it all works out. And the proof works. Huh. That wasn't that bad. Okay, so ATM is NP hard. Let me ask you another question. Well, I just proved to you that ATM is NP hard. Is ATM NP complete? What? Now worlds are really starting to collide. Like, I, I don't like to think about these languages like that. Yeah, well, let's just do it. So what would have to be true for this to be NP complete? Well, we already know that 3SAT reduces to ATM. So we're halfway there. So what's the only other criterion we need to check off to show that this is NP complete? Well, we have to show that we'd be able to verify a solution in polynomial time. Will the solution to the membership problem, what, what might a solution look like? Well, if M accepts W, and I'm trying to verify that it's in that language, a solution to that might be the execution path. Look, it's going to start in state 0, then go to state 5, and go to state 7. It's going to write, you know, 0, 1, 0 on the tape, and I give you all the transitions, and I give you, you know, all, all what the tape's doing, and I say, look, this is a valid execution path in this Turing machine, and it accepts at the end. So theoretically, you should be able to verify it, and you can verify a solution to the ATM problem. You can definitely verify a solution. But what's the fine print? You might not necessarily be able to verify it in polynomial time. Remember, that execution path could be very, very, very long. In fact, the execution path to this Turing machine executing is exponential in length. To, so to verify that solution would take an exponential num uh, amount of time. So OK. I can verify the solution, however, I can't do it in polynomial time, therefore, ATM is not NP complete.
So ATM, and you can prove you know similar things for a lot of the languages we've seen. I think I even asked you to do something on the assignment with the the midterm problem, prove it NP hard. But you should be able to prove like the halting problems NP hard. Uh, basically, every other language we saw before the midterm is NP hard. Just using this this general pattern. Once you understand what's going on and what you need to show and the general strategy, it's actually pretty straightforward. So don't get too you know, intimidated by all this ATM stuff, the halting problem stuff. Just grasp this one, and once you grasp this, you can you can do them all. Trust me, trust me. So I think that's a, a good place to at least pause, and we'll take a look at CoNP after the break. I'll see you then.